Welcome to the Future of Life Institute podcast. I'm Gus Docker. On this episode, I talk with Vincent Boulanin. Vincent got his PhD in political science in 2014, and now he works as a senior researcher at the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. On this episode, we talk about the positives and negatives of incorporating artificial intelligence into our nuclear weapons systems, but we mostly focus on the dangers, including how incorporating AI into these systems changes the game theory of war and changes world leader psychology. Here is Vincent Bolani. Vincent, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for the invitation. It's a, it's a pleasure. Uh, I'm a big fan of, of the podcast. I think we should start by thinking about strategic stability. So maybe just introduce us to this idea. Yeah, I think, I think it's, a, it's a good idea since it's a, it's, um, it's a concept that can be understood differently. Um, there's different definitions. So the term was kind of originally coined during the Cold War um, to describe the, the nature of the strategic relationship between the Soviet Union and the United States. And basically, it was used to describe the absence of incentive for either country to launch a first nuclear strike. So basically, it built on the assumption that stability is achieved by the fear of mutually assured destruction. Um, so if both sides are, have, um, or are confident in their own capability to retaliate or that the other country might be able to retaliate to a first strike, you achieve some form of stability. Uh, and in a sense that they would not be kind of incentivized to build up their nuclear arsenal, and more or less in case of a crisis that they would be less under the pressure uh, to to launch a nuclear strike. Um, so basically, like under that definition, like strategic stability builds on two things: a um, that you need to have some kind of uh, you need to have a second strike capability, so the ability to retaliate if your opponent is is uh, is launching a, a first strike, and second, that um, that retaliatory capability is 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 credible um, that it will be effective and it will be able to kind of survive potential uh, nuclear first strike. So these are the like the baseline component of of how strategic stability is is assured. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. What we're going to talk about in this conversation is how AI might change strategic stability. And what we're most interested in is how AI could be potentially a negative in terms of the stability of the world. But if we're first, it might be interested to, interesting to first look into how AI could be a positive in terms of uh, ensuring strategic stability. One thing you've researched here is the possibility of having better early warning systems. What can you tell us about this? Thanks. So perhaps just to kind of kind of bring a bit of context. So as, as just as I just said, like one of the key component of uh, strike stability is the the confidence that states have a credible uh, re retaliatory capability, right? Uh, that they will be able to kind of respond and detect and respond to a potential first strike. Um, and in that context, so AI can be really helpful. Um, it can basically can be helpful for the entire spectrum of you know, nuclear related capabilities in a sense from, from yeah, detecting nuclear attacks to kind of delivering nuclear weapons to doing nuclear command and control to and others, doing missile defense and everything. Uh, but in, in the context of early warning and, and ISR, the um, why it's helpful because it, it provides the advances of machine learning can provide better kind of a situational awareness and then therefore like more confidence in uh, that the state is able to kind of monitor what the, the, the opponent might be doing. And these benefits derive from the fact that recent advances of, of machine learning basically can unlock, uh, have unlocked significant progress in terms of like perceptual intelligence, so the ability of computers to, uh, to, uh, to make sense of the world um, uh, with having, I don't know, computer vision systems that can detect objects, situation of interest, people, and everything. Um, so the idea is that these advances of machine learning would make ISR systems much more performant in a sense, and that would be one element. And another element would be that also like 
using the kind of the ability of machine learning to kind of like find statistical relationship in data. You can also do more kind of advanced automated kind of intelligence analysis. So you can fuse information from different sources and to see whether they're interesting correlation. And that type of like data processing capability can help uh, basically like decision makers to kind of make assumptions around the adversary's kind of action, intention, um, and ultimately they can help them better kind of foresee or prepare for uh, the next move, let's say. And we're thinking about processing data from satellites here or which kinds of data are we talking about uh, that that's uh, that's being fed into these ai systems so certainly satellite data would be a, a, a critical component but you could also imagine that there are other type of um, data that you can um, you can use any t- anything from you can vacuum information from uh, you know op- open source intelligence sources. So things from the internet, from um, like everything from like social media activity to like press uh, press reports and trying to kind of, you can analyze discourses from leaders and try to find using machine learning to kind of automate the process of finding information of interest in terms of, and I know there are, there are projects that are trying to, for instance, analyze the political discourse of like North Korea. So that process all the kind of political speeches that have been made by different officials to kind of detect indication of a language that would, that could be um, indicating particular kind of intentions or and so. So these are just very, you know, concrete example of the fact that basically any type of intelligence information could be processed in some way by machine learning algorithm. And so we are, would this be part of an early warning system if we're talking about analyzing open sources from North, North Korea, for example, from uh, North Korean state TV? Is, is that, would you categorize that as part of, of improvements in early warning systems? I would make a difference between early warning systems, which are more perhaps if you understand the concept narrowly, more the, the kind of systems that would allow you to kind of detect an actual attack or preparation of attack to uh, what you may more generally call like ISR systems, so systems that provide you intelligence and or allow you to survey and uh, the actions of of, um, of other actors. So I think that would be, I think machine learning is useful for at, at both levels. Uh, but particularly for the more ISR aspect where there it's more about maybe more the long-term uh, aspect of like collecting information, processing it, making sense of it. Could AI also be used to check whether countries are upholding their end of the deal in terms of arms deals or arms control deals? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a very good, um, that's a very good point. Uh, it's, Basically, the same capabilities that you have that a state might deploy for itself in terms of like monitoring the action of of uh, potential adversaries and detect you know situation of interest or a movement of troops or any other type of activities that might be worrying. That same you know process can also be deployed for the more the task of doing doing kind of like arms control monitoring and verification, for instance, like processing. Machine learning can help uh, people that are in charge of verifying and, and monitoring compliance with the existing uh, agreements. They could that would help them process kind of satellite data, for instance, and to see whether states are actually compliant. It can it can speed up the process of finding information of interest. And I know that there are some organizations that are exploring that possibility. Um, so and the Federation of American Scientists, for instance, uh, a U.S. think tank, is is trying to kind of put that approach into practice, and they are trying to explore how machine learning can can be used to analyze trade data and and other type of like um, open source information related to kind of arms control. Um, and the same with another organization called NTI, a Nuclear Threat Initiative. They're also trying to kind of see whether we can use machine learning to kind of process open source data to kind of supplement existing kind of like uh, monitoring and, and verification uh, mechanism. So the overall conclusion here is not that AI is a pure bad in terms of increasing the uh, the 
in terms of uh, upholding the stability of the world. The conclusion here would be something like there are potentially specific cases in which AI could decrease st uh, strategic stability or uh, decrease the stability of the world in general, the, st the stability in between countries. But that there are, there are also other uh, cases in which AI could help. I think maybe now we could, we could move on to these scenarios you've investigated in terms of how AI could decrease the stability of the world, which uh, kind of, which AI technologies could be developed that would make the world a more dangerous place um, for nuclear powers. And one of the things you've investigated is the possibility of remote sensing submarines. So maybe you could tell us about why are submarines interesting um, in terms of nuclear uh, strategic stability? Thanks. So just perhaps to tie back to your last point, I mean, I, I guess the, 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 the key component for strategic stability was this idea of like the confidence, right? So the states have a confidence in their ability to kind of retaliate uh, and that the other enemy will, will, be, will not be incentivized to, to do a first strike. Um, so like the application that I mentioned before can potentially increase that confidence that they are better prepared. Um, but the same, um, you know, capabilities that provide you with more confidence can also trigger insecurity from your adversary. And that's, that's one of the, you know, the, the, the other side of the coin, in a sense. And that, that brings me to this, uh, this question of, of um, remote sensing and submarines that you just uh, uh, introduced. So basically, like, as I said, like, you know, having a credible territory capability is critical. Uh, and usually one considered like, uh, that submarines are the kind of the, the, the ultimate kind of like deterrence tool or like, because it's the arguably the most survivable kind of nuclear delivery platform. They're on the water. They operate over a very large, um, uh, territory. They're mobile. Uh, detecting things on the water is usually very difficult. So basically, like when you have submarines that are deployed, you know that your enemy will have a very hard time finding out where they are and having a preemptive strike on uh, your submarine. So this this idea that basically like submarines are immune to a preventive strike, in a sense. So that that makes the kind of the ultimate retaliation tool. And this is what this is what you mean by nuclear submarines being survivable, correct? Yes, exactly. So. So now to go back to the AI conversation, there's uh, one of the scenario that comes up in the, in the literature when you talk to experts is the possibility that AI, um, especially when you talk about embodied AI, like basically deploying autonomous systems for remote sensing, for basically collecting data and, and you know, sensing the, the environment, um, that could undermine um, the survivability of uh, Submarines, or at least it would make them harder to kind of to hide and to stay undetected. Um, and they build on the assumption that uh, so a, AI can can allow you to kind of deploy or develop and deploy more autonomous uh, platforms, so like air drones, but also underwater um, systems that potentially you could develop in large numbers. Um, and deploy in large numbers and have them roam over like you know a large a large area and basically that if you have a lot of systems like that are just kind of like uh, loitering around in the ocean that would be harder for for submarines to hide and then that's something that could then trigger uh, insecurity from the side of the countries that usually rely on these submarines for as a deterrent capability so that's that's one of the uh, scenario that has been discussed, it's hotly debated whether that, that actually is uh, a problem. There are some people that believe that actually that uh, the idea that it would kind of like change, the, that it would be a game changer is kind of like, um, yeah, some people kind of question that. Notably, uh, if I may, like, um, I guess the main reason is that detecting things on the water is still very hard. Um, so you may have a lot of uh, underwater vehicles, but uh, the the, real, the laws of physics makes that the environment, the underwater environment, are you know they are just very hard to observe with actual sensors. So you know the environment distorts signals and, and and so on. So it's you know it's not very efficient. It's not like you can have like when in you are in the air, you can have a, a camera that 
provide you like a high resolution picture, right? It doesn't, doesn't work in, on the water. Um, so basically like it's, it's still hard to detect things on the water. Uh, so you need to have a lot of systems uh, out there. And also there's also the practical difficulty of, okay, what if you detect a submarine that is kind of like passing by? You, you need to potentially need to track it and then submarines can, they can travel very quickly. Uh, some of them are nuclear powered and so they go very fast. So that the tracking of, of submarines would be an actual just practical difficulty. So, um, so it's not like suddenly like submarines would be uh, totally kind of threatened and no longer or become obsolete in a sense. Yeah, so it's difficult to develop this technology because of just the vastness of the ocean and maybe the optic, optics of the water and so on. So even if we have advanced AI uh, trying to find these submarines, they will just just from the inherent physics of of spotting submarines it's it's an it's an it's a very complex problem yeah i mean in a sense that it was not be, it would not be as effective as some people would assume um the perhaps the one situation where you could make a difference um is for instance for states that don't have a lot of submarines uh or or because of the you know where they are in the world their submarines would have to travel in specific areas so you could imagine that potentially people could try to kind of concentrate the deployment of the sensing uh, autonomous systems in like what you may call choke points or like points where they would assume that submarines might travel through uh, either to kind of go on, you know, uh, to go for uh, some reconnaissance or whatever. Um, so that, that could be a possibility that it would make things harder potentially for some of these countries to travel in some key areas that where they're supposed to to loiter or to, to maneuver. So that's one possibility. That Again, then the ultimate question is whether that would undermine their confidence in, um, in their retiratory capa- capability. It's not it's debated. So that's one possibility. The possibility is that, that AI would make it easier to spot submarines, thereby undermining the confidence of nations who are relying on nuclear submarines for their deterrence effect. Another possibility would be to that AI could enhance conventional weapons, which would make it more diff, or which would make it easier to attack nuclear targets with conventional weapons. How realistic is this uh, scenario? Um, that, that's that's a good question. I mean, in uh, in the expert field, we call that the entanglement problem. So the idea that uh, as kind of conventional weapons become kind of better, uh, it might become more feasible to use them against uh, nuclear assets. And there's the concern that AI is one of that technological development that contributes to making conventional weapons much more efficient. Um, and there are different, you know, it can, AI can do that in different ways. Uh, first of all, you can, you can use machine learning to make to further develop the missile guidance, uh, the guidance systems of, of missiles, for instance, uh, so you can make precision guided missions that are that are um, that are better. Uh, for instance, you you can I know that there are research that is looking at using machine learning to kind of develop the control systems of hypersonic missiles, um, so that they would be better at evading and penetrating um, air defenses. So that's one thing. Um, you could also rely on the recent progress of, of AI to kind of deploy more autonomous, stealthy combat drones, uh, again, which could be deployed to uh, strike nuclear assets. Um, so that's another possibility. A third possibility would be that it, you use AI more in the c- cyber operation uh, realm. So the idea of like you can use AI to kind of conduct cyber offensive operation against the nuclear command and control of your adversary. Uh, one in again it's a jargon term, but it's called the kind of left of launch operation. So the idea that you would you would attack the command and control so that the enemy would not be able to launch an attack. Um, so that's another possibility. And finally, uh, you can also use AI to kind of um, for like electronic warfare, where you would try to defeat the defenses of your enemy um, through or by form of jamming and other kind of yeah electronic based kind of like attacks, and you can use machine learning to kind of better understand the signals of their systems and, and develop kind of like jamming uh, possibilities. 
What about incorporating AI directly into nuclear command and control systems? I'm, I'm specifically thinking about incorporating AI into nuclear launch systems. It seems to me to be the most, the, the scariest possibility. Are countries attempting to do this? How realistic is it that this would happen? Thanks. That's a good question. So there's two, there two dimensions of it. So there's the um, using advance of AI for the delivery aspect. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, where you can use AI to kind of have more autonomous kind of delivery platform. Um, that might not be such a game changing in the sense where, you know, when you think of uh, one of the critical kind of uh, nuclear delivery platform, these intercontinental ballistic missiles, they are, you know, once they are launched, more or less, they, they operate autonomously, they go to their targets and, you know, they, they are not remotely controlled. Um, and possibly, like, you could imagine that, you know, you could have unmanned, uh, on crude bombers, there would be more or less autonomous in there. Um, that's one other thing, but I'm not sure it would be a game changer. And also, like apparently, like states are generally like not very confident with the idea of using on crude systems, like on crude bombers or on crude submarines for for nuclear uh, weapon delivery, uh, for political and, and security reasons. Russia being the kind of the exception uh, because they have declared that. Um, they are developing this this autonomous torpedo called the Poseidon, which can operate autonomously and could be used for nuclear delivery. Uh, but at the same time, they, they argued that they still want to have some form of human control over the decision to launch. Um, so it's kind of unclear. Uh, but in general, I think there's a sense that um, states, the other dimension, so like deliver, as I just talked about the delivery aspect, but the critical aspect, as you said, is, is more the launch decision from the research that we've done. And, and when we talk to experts, the general sense was that more or less no state is interested in, in automating that decision because it's the, perhaps the most political you know, decision people have to make, like whether they will use nuclear weapons or not, because what is at stake is basically like you know, the security of the entire world. So it's it's look a fairly unlikely possibility that that process would be uh, kind of like uh, purely automated, but we cannot exclude you know um, that there might be some situation where some states might be tempted by that option. Uh, and why would the why would they be tempted by that option? Uh, which state uh, might be tempted by that option? The only things that can talk in favor of that option uh, is the fact that arguably that has been done in the past for deterrence reasons. So there have been reports that the that the Soviet Union had developed a form of semi-automated retaliatory system in the case of a decapitating attack on the political and military command. Um, so if it was like a very kind of if and then kind of decision tree. Huh? So if the entire kind of Russian, like Soviet Union command and control was, was killed. If no one was responding to kind of uh, some, uh, to calls and so on, and then the decision would be to kind of launch a retaliatory attack, auto more or less automatically. So there will still be some people involved in the action of launching, but, but the decision tree was very kind of like more or less automated. So that happened in the past. Arguably, that system is still um, online, they have, uh, the Russian Federation has, uh, has made statements that seem to indicate that put, argue that system might still be active. Well, um, and that could be, um, yeah, that's, that, the, the, the purpose of it is just meaning to kind of dissuade, um, deter a possible first strike against that territory, I guess. Um, saying that if, if you try to kind of, you know, I don't know, like launch a nuclear strike on Moscow, um, there will be there will be a response, whatever, um, and it's not impossible that some some countries, which are very insecure, uh, could be tempted by that possibility. We've talked about now some options, some possibilities where AI might help develop new technology that could decrease the stability of the world. But there's also the game theory and uh, leader psychology of AI development. Here, uh, I'm thinking about kind of a, an AI capabilities race between states, which I think it would be driven by 
by the, the game theory of leaders reacting to other leaders developing AI. Maybe we could talk about what is, what is such, a, such a, a capability arms race. Mm. It's a good question. So as a pass as a privilege to underline the fact that in the field of strategy, things are highly psychological. So the perception or your uh, enemy's capability matters as much as the actual capability. So that point might be worth underlining here. Why, why would it be the case that the perception of a, a, a state's capability would matter as much as the state's actual capability? Because in the case of AI, um, it's potentially because it's to a large extent an intangible technology that is not visible to the naked eye. Um, there's not necessarily a lot of like empirical evidence of what the capabilities of the countries um, of the country uh, is in that domain, right? So it's not like you can count the number of tanks or the number of silos or missiles. When you talk about the use of AI in some potential nuclear or other conventional um, um, systems, um, it's hard to assess. So, like, then that's where we talk about, you know, it's the, just the belief that another state might have some capabilities might trigger some reaction, and that's that. What is potentially concerning with AI because it's harder to get a sense of what the adversary's capabilities are. That it could trigger some state to kind of like. You know, take true conclusions and decide to kind of react accordingly. One way to react, as you just said, is to engage in um, um, an arms race on AI or like a capability race on AI, like also trying to kind of develop AI capabilities and try to integrate these capabilities within military systems and including potentially nuclear related systems. That would be a possibility. And the reality is, is that it's kind of already the case where there are already evidence that there is a kind of a strategic competition on AI between major powers, including uh, especially nuclear armed states. We looked at that, and all of them have released policy documents that kind of indicate an ambition to kind of like be part of that kind of great power competition on AI. I mean, perhaps the exception is is North Korea because the sources are not, you know highly available, let's say. But when it comes to China, France, India, Russia, the UK, the US, we have all found documents that indicate that they want to kind of invest in AI for military reasons. These documents do not always make the direct connection with nuclear, uh, but it's, they clearly indicate that they see AI as a key element of their future capabilities. So that's, they give an impression that there is already some kind of a, an arms race um, on, on that. So in a sense, the arms race has already begun because all states have uh, noted that their interest in developing um, AI capabilities for, for military purposes. Um, have any states indicated that they want to abstain from engaging in an, arm, in an arms race? I mean, when it comes to kind of nuclear arms states, I mean, obviously, the you know, arms race is a very loaded term. So... They would not, be, you know, mention it or talk talk about it in that way. Uh, I, I guess what is the concern, and that that is shared by a number of of nuclear arms states, is the possibility that as states are, you know, trying to kind of compete on that front, that some of them might be tempted to kind of do a race to the bottom in terms of uh, AI safety. That that they. they in order to try to keep up, they will be less concerned about um, standards of like testing and evaluation, and that basically that they might adopt AI in an irresponsible way, in a premature way, deploy systems that are not properly tested, that have not, that might not be highly reliable. And the fear is that if they do so, if some states do so, that it could increase the risk of having, um, yeah, technologies that perform in a way that would not be adequate and that tr could trigger some incident that could have potentially dramatic consequences. So. so maybe we could look at the incentives from the perspective of the states that are, say, uh, economically and militarily weaker than other states. Their incentive is to try to catch up in AI development so as to not be left behind. And could this then cause the states that are more advanced economically and militarily to 
see their the, the the see the actions of the weaker states as a as an escalation, and then you have kind of like a feedback cycle where uh, con- where nuclear states are reacting to the actions uh, that they are each taking. Mm. Yeah, and I think that's that's the that's the what we call the security dilemma, right? So things that states might do to increase their security, so building up an arsenal, uh, investing more, might trigger the insecurity of the adversary that in turn might react in ways that then will undermine potentially your own security. So that's a kind of a virtual cycle in a sense. So the question is how how that virtual cycle can be controlled in a way or and mitigated um, so that you don't have this kind of like destabilizing kind of like armament dynamics um, that would, yeah, especially in, in periods of tension or crisis could have dramatic effect. You've investigated a number of foreseeable risk scenarios for how things could go wrong with the implementation of AI in nuclear systems. And you distinguish between accidental escalation inadvertent escalation and deliberate escalation. Let's maybe talk about accidental escalation first and specifically how this might happen with AI. Uh, thanks. So I guess the accidental escalations, as, as I said, it's, it's, it's about the idea that things might escalate without actual intention to escalate. Um, and one, I mean, the, the logical pathway is that basically there's a kind of a tension, right? So on a sense, AI is supposed to kind of give commanders or military should make a better information. It should supposed to kind of allow them to process information, more larger volume, more quickly, and make better decisions quicker. The challenge is that, or the paradox is that it can also increase the pace of warfare. Um, as, as states can make decisions quicker, also deploy, because you like execute this decision more quickly using autonomous systems and so on. That might you know, increase the speed of warfare, which in turn reduce the decision-making time and further incentivize to automate um, the kind of like the kill chain or whatever, like the, the decision-making process and, and, um, and so on. So as this kind of like, as part of the decision-making process gets more automated or more reliant on automated processes and states also rely more potentially on autonomous systems including autonomous weapons then there's the risk that should a technical event happen that could have that could trigger accidental escalation and we have seen example in the past where um there were some issues in the interaction between the human and the human decision maker and especially when the situation was very kind of like time sensitive that that triggers some um, some um, yeah some development that were uh, problematic what's the example you have in mind here so i guess i mean the the most famous example which is which eventually did not lead to an escalation was the the petrov incident in 1983 where Basically, like the system, the early warning system detected uh, an attack from the US. Um, and if the, the Petrov, the, the commander in charge at the time, just followed the, instru- I mean, followed the information that the system was providing, that could have basically like, triggered uh, a retaliatory strike and potentially like, you know, the third, third World War, nuclear war. It didn't happen. In in that case, because the um, the commander didn't have sufficient trust in the system and used kind of common sense that allowed him to kind of understand that okay, that might not make sense. Maybe I'll, I'm gonna hold off and try to kind of uh, on that basically save the world. So uh, so uh, it's uh, he's a hero for that. But there are other other incidents in the past where things didn't get as you know things didn't turn out as well when there have been. We have been exempt of factory sites where um, one example is the is where in, in Iraq in, in 2003, where the US missile defense system, the Patriot, was involved in two factory sites. So basically the the operators were were you know you they didn't have enough time to kind of verify the information. They had to make a call and it, they ended up shooting their own you know colleagues. Um, 
Um, so like uh, it was friendly fire basically. Um, yeah, so these are some of the the problems that emerge from from the kind of um, yeah the increased reliance on automated processes. So the classic pro there are three classic problems: a you over rely on the system and that can lead to an accident. So the system is failing, is misidentifying mis something, and you rely on it, and boom, that's that was the the wrong decision, or you you don't trust it enough and you misinterpret the data and you you um, you act on it. So there have been also examples of some commercial aircraft that have been uh, destroyed, uh, notably one in uh, in uh, the Iran flight 655 in 1988 that was uh, destroyed by the Aegis combat system in the, on a warship called the USS Vincent. Um, that's another example. And and then the, the patch up example that I mentioned was more like the third problem in terms of like what we call the out of the loop problem, where basically like you you are you have people sort of monitoring the system, nothing is happening for hours, and then suddenly within the space of minutes, they have to kind of make a judgment call, like, okay, can I the system is telling that we are there's an attack going on, I have three minutes to react, what should I do? And re we know there's a lot of research on that that shows that regaining situational awareness and making this decision in a short, short, short amount of time can be can be challenging. So that really is the core of the problem, the fact that automated systems shorten decision time cycles such that the humans that are supposed to check whether the automated systems are doing their job correctly have, what are we talking, minutes to make a decision and then I mean, you, you can just imagine yourself in this situation under immense time pressure. Uh, you have knowledge of how big the stakes involved are, and then you have to make a decision. You could, you can easily imagine all sorts of um, biases, uh, all sorts of uh, biased human cognition happening in, in that scenario. Maybe we should talk about the difference between accidental escalation that we just covered and then inadvertent escalation. What what is inadvertent uh, escalation, and what's the difference between the two things? I guess it's it's connected to the notion of intentionality. So uh, in the accident part, is there were no intention, but in the case of inadvertent attack, like there's some kind of intention, like there's a decision that is made to escalate, but perhaps the basis on which that decision is made is is wrong, or is, is uh, and a basic example would be. Say you have a situation where let me roll back a bit. The baseline is because AI, as I said earlier, like it's a, it's a, it's not you can observe the cap the AI capabilities of the system or whether a system is autonomous, like just by looking at it. So you have, let's say, you have a drone coming at you. It might be difficult for the person who is detecting the drone to make an assessment whether that's a remotely controlled drone whether it's an autonomous drone. It's also not necessarily clear what the drone is out there to do, whether it's just to collect information, to do reconnaissance, or whether it could be there to kind of launch an attack. And then there's also, if it's a large one, there could be what um, uncertainty around the payload, whether it's a conventional payload or potentially a nuclear payload. Um, so an inadvertent escalation would be a situation where a drone is coming and then the person who detected the drone might mistake that mistake mistake the intention and might say, okay, maybe that that drone is coming is is intended to kind of launch a strike, and um, I need to respond by I don't know uh, destroying that drone or that could have, and then that's a that's an intentional escalation that is that can have that can then trigger a chain of events. Um, so that's that's one scenario that we identify in our work when we talk to. Um, to people, then to what extent that will be the case in reality? That's, that's a much more complex um, problem. There are many examples in the past where there have been incidents with drones and so on, and it does not necessarily lead to uh, escalation. But that's that's one possibility that um, that we discussed. So even the perception that a system might be autonomous could increase risk. So this is again the the case in which. Um, Perception matters a lot in these scenarios. It's not necessarily that I, I wouldn't 
tie it to the autonomous aspect, to be honest. I think it's more about uh, what the system is out to do, I guess. So, I mean, whether it's remotely controlled or autonomous, the, the, what changed with autonomy is the fact that perhaps it's maybe harder to jam the system and jam the communication link between the platform and the command. So if it's an autonomous platform that is out for doing a, ta- you know, a targeted strike, it might be harder to kind of, yeah, to use that, that avenue to kind of like defeat the system. Like it's, you will be like more resistant to kind of communication denial and everything. So that's a complicating factor, but the, the, the fundamental question is the question of signaling, whether to understand the intention of the enemy. And if the intentions are mistaken, that could trigger a scalatory chain of event. What about the case of deliberate escalation? How could AI be involved here? Thanks. So I guess it for deliberate escalation, um, that ties back to the question of confidence. Um, so we had in our work we identified kind of two two scenarios. Uh, the first one would be that a state would decide to launch a preemptive strike based on, let's say, AI-based information showing that the enemy is preparing a surprise attack. Um, so all the intel that you have collected and you have processed all that data, you have used remote sensors and everything that give you um, information that something might run away. And then for to ensure that you will have a strategic advantage, you decide to strike first. That could be one possibility. It's a very, you might argue, a bit far-fetched, but that's, that's one. Um, the second scenario would be um, where there's a, a, a major kind of like imbalance in terms of like uh, between the two states in terms of notably in the conventional domain. So you are one state that um, if they know that they are not able to compete at the conventional level because they are fighting against a state that's much more technology advanced, they have like, you know, like fighter aircraft, drones and everything, um, various type of missiles and so on. Um, that yeah, they could be tempted to kind of use nuclear weapons as a preemptively to kind of deter, um, um, yeah, deter the other states to kind of um, uh, engage. But then, obviously, like then the question of whether it's a, it would be kind of political suicide because that would trigger a chain of of command. But that, that's the scenario that I've been discussing the in the literature. Um, and I guess maybe one thing to undermine. I think at the end of the day, I mean. AI would just be one component of a much larger set of contextual like elements that would determine whether things gonna escalate or not. There is a lot of things already to what's happening on the, at the pol- politically in that very situation, whether there's already existing tension, what actors we are talking about, all of them might react differently. Great, so we've discussed how advances in AI technology could threaten the strategic stability of the world. And we've discussed how game theory and leader psychology surround in the kind of the AI space could could also threaten strategic stability. If you were to, in your expert opinion, what, what is the biggest potential problem here? What What's the most important um, thing to get right? That's a good question, I guess. The num these two things. A, on one hand, we know that the adoption of recent advances of AI, not machine learning, will not be. They, they might take some time in general, generally because like it, we assume that states are very conservative when it comes to integrating new technologies in their nuclear, you know, deterrence architecture. But I guess the challenge is that as earlier, like what is concerning would be a, a race to the bottom on. AI safety, the fact that some states might decide to adopt AI too quickly, irresponsibly, and deploy systems that might not be highly reliable or too automated. And that would then fuel the, or increase the risk of, um, yeah, basically what we call nuclear risk, so the risk of, of having a situation escalate to uh, nuclear weapon use. I guess that's the, that's the concern that that AI might, rather than reduce nuclear risk, might fuel the nuclear risk, so the possibility that something could escalate to a nuclear lab. That's certainly a scary possibility. Vincent, uh, thank you for speaking with me. It's been very informative. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. 
And that's it for this episode. On the next episode, I talk with Vincent about what we can do to mitigate the dangers we've just discussed. Hope to see you there.